Um, before we move on, I just want to um, show you uh, something as well, uh, in addition to this uh, frequency stuff and the cortical model. Um, if I go back to here. Okay, if we, if we take the cortical model, so obviously we had the picture here. Z G Z U actually is all down. So follow my own Z G Z U Z S. We've got K S C S K T. Okay, and uh, basically. Uh, yeah, we can apply some Newton's laws to these things. So M, Z, S, that's going to be C, S, Z, um, S minus Z, U, dot, dot, minus K, this is minus S, C, S, those. Okay, that's one one equation. Obviously, you can rearrange that to be, um, and then, and then we've got uh, m z u double dot is going to be minus c s z u dot minus z s dot minus k s z u minus z s minus k t. Z U minus Z G. Okay, two equations um, for each of the two masses. Okay, so this is for the sprung mass. This is for the unsprung mass. Unsprung. Okay. Now there is a way we can actually model these together. Okay, um, and build a, a model in. In, uh, in MATLAB. So we just uh, So if I am, um, so like I said, so we've got these uh, those two equations. If I share a different screen, so if I stop sharing and go back to uh, here, share window. So one of the one of the features of MATLAB is this, is this tool called Simulink, which is basically a block based uh, simulation uh, tool package. Okay, you see a block diagram there. Um, if I go into it, okay, so basically this model represents those equations, okay, so in here we've got um, we've got the ground coming in, so this is the ground input, it's a G input, okay, um, ground's coming into this block, we've got the, uh, coming out of this block we've got the um, ZU, uh, it's called ZU dot one, what is it, uh, ZU double dot, yeah, ZU Yeah, because that's ZG, that's ZG dot. Okay, so that's the velocity coming out. Okay. Um, integrate it, you get the acceleration. No, you get the integrate it, you get the uh, the displacement. Okay, so that's coming in here. Um, it's going into here. Yeah, so that's, this gives you our, what's this going to give us? This is going to give us our, yeah, okay, so that's going to be the motion of the uh, suspension. Okay, so this dot is the, Okay, yeah. So coming into here, we've got the inputs, the ZG, K 
goes into my model of the of the quarter car, which is this thing here. So here's the equation. So z u double dot. Okay, this is the unsprung mass. Z u double dot. If you remember, was um, if you um, uh, multiply by m, so we're going backwards. Uh, equals minus k t times by z u z g. Okay, minus z g. Then we've got uh, uh, we've got c c um, one in here, and we've got K1, okay. Um, oh, there, oh, sorry, I'm not defined. I'll just go back in there. Um, um, in fact, I just, we should just call this CS. Oops, oops. Okay. Not CS. Okay. Um, so yeah. So that, that, so that, 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 this is the MU equation. Okay, or ZU equation. And this comes out. This is ZU output. Okay, this is our ZU. Okay, and then this is our um, ZU dot. Okay. Okay. ZU. ZU. Okay. Um, and then this this one is ZU dot. Okay. So if I bring this one bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's coming out, okay, and obviously it goes through the springs. So, so like I said, you build a model up, and basically the output over here would be the motion of the unsprung mass, okay. And so that's going out of the uh, of the of this of the spring block, okay, into integrates it, okay, to give us our unsprung. Uh, so that's the Z U, okay. Um, so let's do this now. Z U. Okay, um, and obviously the velocity goes in here. So again, we've got the velocity of our, where is it? Is it S? Oh yeah, so Z U goes through. And then if we get the, uh, coming out of here, we've got ZS, which is the motion of the, uh, of the, um, of the, uh, and then we've got the ZS dot coming out. Okay, so yeah, so basically what this what this model enables you to do is to go go around the different loops and basically we've got an input here of Z G, which is our input um of the road, and then um Z if we look at after it does the simulation, if we look at the output. The displacement of the strong body, you can compare the road and the and the input. So, what I've got here is let's we've got a frequency here of uh, sinusoidal input um, of an amplitude of ten centimeters up and down, with a frequency of five radians per second. So, um, so and we've got a simulation time of five seconds. Okay, so let's see if we run it. Okay, um, so you can see that uh, the yellow is the um, is the um, well, the blue is the road input, and the yellow is the body output. So you can see at five radians per second, we're getting quite a big um, oscillation. In fact, five radians per second is probably quite close to the, um, the body bounce. So if I can if I just do uh, With that, in fact, yeah, the body bounce in radians per second is about 3.7. So if I can back in the mix. So uh, if I oh, zoomed in, yeah. oh. the thing is, the share windows. Sorry. Yeah, I know. I just realised that. So if I'm gonna, what I'll do is actually I'll share the my screen. So if I share the screen, yeah. share screen. Okay. Can you share? Can you see my um, MATLAB screen? If I go back to the model, yeah. Okay. So yeah. So this is my. This is obviously the model. So what I'll do is I'll change this. Um, I'll change this down to I don't know, like one radius per second. Let's see what that does. I'll run that. 
So you can see that the body is basically following the, the motion of the wheel. Okay, so the wheel is the blue, the yellow is the, is the body. Okay, and as you increase as you increase your uh, the frequency, okay, you're going to hit the the frequency at which the body is going to be excited. So, and I've actually saved. I've got in my MATLAB um, screen. If I go back to the uh, MATLAB window, okay. Um, uh, let's set this to be the values that we had in the exercise. So this is a uh, what was it in the exercise? 200. Okay, and use 23. Okay, we had K being the um, right. Uh, that's not why. So KS, uh, CS was 180. Okay, B3 C, uh, so CS. What was CS? Oh, CS, I'll just leave as a thousand. Um, and then we've got K, which is the spring stiffness, so that's 80. And we had a lead ratio of 1.6, I think. That's all. So that's all worry about the wheel basing track. That's for a different different problem. Okay. So there's K at CS. Okay, so uh, right, if we run it. Run this. This is a script, okay. <coughs> Remember the body bounce frequency FS. Oops. Sorry, well, let's go for the wheel rate, um, which we call KS and the KR. So there's a there's our spring rate with the lead ratio. There's the wheel rate which we had as our solution. FS body bounce frequency 1.84, and FU um, frequency FS. You know, FS. You know, hot. Um, 15.25 there we go so those are the values that we had okay and uh and so if we multiply the body amount frequency times 2 pi we get it in hertz in radians per second so 11.5385 so if i put that um into my model so go back to the uh, zg input okay and i do fsbb times by 2 pi okay there's my frequency, apply that up to my model, and run it. So we're now exciting the system at the body bounce frequency. And so you should see, look at the road input, okay? That's my 10 centimeters, and you can see the body, because we're exciting at that frequency, is uh, is is uh, having a well over time, going up to 30, 30 centimeters, over 30 centimeters, in terms of uh, amplitude, okay? Um, that's because we're exciting at that frequency. But if we go faster on the same road, okay, so essentially we're going to go, let's go faster. So that was, what is that? FSBB times, oops, FSBB times by 2 pi. What was that? What was that actual value? 11.53. So let's go for, I don't know, let's go for 15, what's that? 95. So let's go for, let's go for 30 radius per second. So if I go to, um, Sorry. So we're going to drive along the road faster. We're going to go to uh, 30 radians per second. Okay. So you should see now. So look at the road now. Look at the body. Much less uh, in terms of response. Much less amplitude. Okay. And if we if we actually go to the um, the you know, it's a 95, wasn't it? The wheel hop. Much bigger. So if we run that now, the body is hardly moving compared to the inputs. Okay, let's go for a couple of seconds on input just to make it a bit clearer. Okay, so there's our there's our body motion compared to the wheel motion. And if we actually go into here and we actually look at the input of the output of the uh, so there's ZG. That should show us our ground input, okay. And if we we then plot, um, so there's our ZG, there's our unspun mass. If I make this two input ports, oops, two input ports. let me stick this in here. So then we run it. So the ground is the, I'll swap them around. 
So the blue is ground input, and the yellow is the uh, is the um, is the uh, wheel off. So like I said, because we're now exciting at the wheel off, you can see you can see the wheel is is bouncing off of that um, suspension spring, and the body's hardly moving. So like I said, so that uh, shows you the uh, the motion of those two things. Okay, so that's a, that's basically a model that you can uh, I'll stick up on Blackboard for you to have a play with. But basically, it's the quarter com model, and you can adjust these various values in there. In fact, that's the uh, is that MS? That should possibly be different. That's the uh, mass of the vehicle, isn't it? So the MS, which is two hundred. I think that's right. Yeah. Let's go for that one. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. So that's the um, like I said, that's the uh, um, the uh, motion of the wheel and the motion of the body. Um, you can see that um, it becomes as you increase the frequency. You get less and less. Okay, so um, that's a, yeah, that's a model for you to have a little play with. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, so you, yeah, you have access to some of the uh, PCs, and if you've got that level of your computer, you can play with the body map uh, with this quadcar model. Okay, to do that, you need to load up this um, parameters file, which I'll um, I'll set to be. Uh, um, so the things we don't need out of here. Okay, and you can obviously have a look. And obviously, that also contains the solutions to this problem. Um, so, the last question 2.1. Okay, so you run that and then you open up the, the, the simulator model um, and then uh, calculate the problems. Okay, which is called QC model. So that. So, uh, drive. No sport performance. Okay. Right. Um. Okay. So let's uh, move on from that. Uh, we'll go back to um. Yeah. Stop showing that. Okay, so let's keep going. Um, we've got a bit more. Okay, so um, yeah, so in terms of um, there's also a way to work out spring length. Okay, when you um, so imagine the the wheel is going over a bump in the road. Okay. So the compression is going to be the corner weight divided by the wheel centre weight. Okay, that's your F equals kx. So here's your load in newtons or your mass, whatever. Um, yeah, no, your load. Okay, equals k, which is this times by your compression. F equals kx. So basically, this is f, k, and x. Um, and then uh, so and then the wheel movement is going to be the bump times by this initial compression. So if you've got your twenty millimeter bump or whatever. Plus the compression of the wheel, okay, which is based upon the the weight on the wheel and the spring spring rate of the wheel, okay, you're going to get this compression. So the total movement of the wheel is going to be those two things added together, and so your spring, oops, spring length needs. To, uh, sorry, okay, the spring obviously you've got the you've got your uh, lever lever ratio in here, so you divide the total wheel by your lever rate, you get total spring movement. And your spring length needs to be twice the spring movement. Okay, so if your spring movement when you've got the bump, so say you've got a 50 millimeter uh, bump or something, you can work out the total um, total wheel movement with the leverage. You can work out the total spring movement, and you need to make sure your tw spring is at least twice as long as the as the movement, and you'll get the, uh, the spring the spring length, optimal spring length. Okay. There's an exercise at the end of the chapter if you have a go at these. Okay, um, now on to anti-roll bars. So these are basically 
used in addition to body spring. So the body spring is dealing with the vertical motion, um, either per wheel uh, or the heel of the whole chassis up and down. Okay. But in terms of looking at roll or even pitch, then you can have uh, stiffness, additional stiffness to the um, to, to give you better roll stiffness. Um, so you can still have soft springs, um, but a high roll stiffness. Okay. And like I said, usually these are a torsion bar connecting both sides of, a, of the suspension, both sides of the car um, to each other. Okay. So they, although you might have independent suspension, you'll actually end up with dependent suspension. If you include anti roll bar, because what happens on one side will impact what happens on the other side, okay? But it can give you roll stiffness, okay? Um, so the compression of one side delivers an aligning torque around the roll axis, so it tries to resist the body from rolling, resisting roll, but it's independent of the vertical spring weight. So, like I said, you can have soft springs, but a stiff anti roll bar will give you good um, you know, ride comfort in the vertical motion, so wheel you know, bumps and this sort of stuff. But in the corners, you can get um, good uh, uh, good roll stiffness because obviously, if you've got soft springs all round and there's no roll bar, then obviously in the corner, the vehicle's going to roll quite a lot. As well. Okay. Um, and so, like I said, linking the sides means that the suspension's no longer independent um, because what happens on one side will impact the other side. Okay. So if you look at the anti-roll bar, this is a, a schematic. So you've got the wheels on each side of axle. And you can see that if you connect this to a bar between the two wheels, as one side moves up, the other side will also want to move up. But uh, but obviously, if this side, if one side doesn't move, the other side is going to be resisted from moving by the fact that this uh, bar will have to twist. Okay, so it's a torsion spring. The non-torsion spring designs are based around sort of hydraulics and valves, which you can also set up, and some cars will have that sort of uh, setup. In terms of the roll stiffness, um, uh, to have variable roll stiffness, that sort of stuff. So they enable chassis engineers to give adequate roll stiffness with, without increasing the vertical suspension stiffness. Okay, um, it can well roll can produce adverse camber depending on the uh, the type of suspension you've got. Um, as the body rolls, you might end up with the cam with the wheels also cambering outside of the of the corner. Um, car so uh, outside of the corner so which you don't really want to do um so like i said you want to uh, you want to try and maintain um a, a flat ride to make sure the camera doesn't get adversely affected um and you can tune to affect the handling balance like i said um there's a if you if you want to increase understeer in a car okay so you want to encourage a car to understeer you give it more front roll stiffness and if you want to decrease the amount of understeer then you can increase the rear roll stiffness that's um, actually demonstrated, um, if you take that to the limit, um, by um, cars that become tripods in corners. Okay, so I've got a couple of pictures here. So here we've got a, a, a hot hatch. And you can see if you corner really hard in hot hatches, what happens is the inside rear wheel will lift off the ground. And that's because you've got a, a probably more rear roll stiffness than front roll stiffness. So the front wheels remain in contact with the ground. Okay, the rear roll stiffness is so high that in a hard corner where the body is rolling a lot, you actually um, lift the inside rear wheel off the ground. Okay, and you see that in quite a few hot hatches. And if you remember back at uh, the beginning of this chapter, we said about the fact that the axle with traction needs relatively soft suspension to maintain traction and bumpy roads. Well, that's essentially what's going on here. Okay, so the, you can see the both front wheels are, are in contact with the ground, but the back wheels. Because of the roll surface at the back, because you don't want to, you know, it's not desired. Oh, I just will have a tendency to understeer, and so you stick a load of roll surface in the rear axle, and you'll actually get, get a car that has less understeer. Okay, and here clearly you can see that that's the case. Old Porsche 911s, they had a tendency to act a bit like what they are, is a rear engine um, uh, vehicle, and which has a tendency, a natural tendency to under oversteer, okay, the back end being quite a lot heavier. And you can see that this is a old 911 going around the corner very fast on the racetrack, and the inside front wheel is coming off the ground. Okay, so like I said, that's also something that can happen. And so obviously, the you know, because in a, in a quest to uh, quell the amount of oversteer, you stick a, a, a stiff anti-roll bar on the front of the car, and like I said, what you end up happening is the inside front wheel can come off the ground in a, in a hard corner, okay? 
So that shows you the impact of anti-roll bars. Now the last bit about springs is what's known as the heave spring or the Z bar. Okay, and basically the Z bar is exactly the opposite from an anti-roll bar. Okay, so what you end up is you have a, a essentially a Z shaped bar. It does nothing to inhibit roll, but what it does do is when the wheels compress together, you get this twist in the Z bar, so that it resists that motion. And so if you're looking at heave, where the whole um, chassis goes up and down, okay, or the whole axle goes up and down, um, you get the twist in the Z bar, which resists that motion. So it's called also called a heave spring. Okay, and allows the vertical springs to be soft, but a high resistance to heave. Okay, and if you've got a car, for example, that's got lots of downforce, Obviously, as the, you speed up, the car is going to be pushed down by the downforce. But obviously, to resist that being pushed down, okay, you still want to get the, the downforce going through the wheels. But to resist the the ride height dropping or the heave motion to drop, you stick a Z bar in. That will resist that actual motion, so that all the all force goes into, as opposed to compressing the spring, the vertical springs, it goes into um, uh, um, uh, pushing the wheels into the ground in a sense, okay, because that that um, motion is actually resisted by the Z bar. Um, so this is sort of, sort of a schematic of how it looks. So you can see that if you've got the one wheel, as that goes up, okay, um, the other wheel uh, will go down, okay, basically what's going on there. And the way to do that is you end up with a, with a system where you have a roll bar through the, through the chassis, and it, on one side it's connected to the outside, uh, to like, say, the rear of the, uh, the, the suspension and on the other side is connected to the front of the suspension and you, so you can see that as this wheel goes up that means this arm goes up okay which means that this arm because it's z shape will go down okay um, and, uh, and so you end up like I said with this torsion in the bar or the chassis so this is both this is two sides of one other car there's obviously a bit I've taken out of the middle just to show okay this actually is the back end of the McLaren um, uh, 12C, okay, um, MP4 12C, um, uh, which has a heave bar because there's an active rear wing, um, um, and uh, obviously, and they, and they also use uh, um, for anti-roll. They've got a hydraulic system, so you don't need you can. They've got roll control as well as the Z bar, so you can do both. But they're using different methods for that. Okay, you can see the heave spring. Like I said, you'll also find heave springs on, on uh, uh, motorsport applications where there's high levels of downforce uh, because of the fact that you want to try and minimize the drop in ride height when the vehicle's going fast. Okay. So that's a heave spring. Any questions? Okay, so um, we'll move on. Uh, so dampers, okay. Um, remember that these are not called dampeners. And in fact, that's, that's incorrect there. There should be damping oscillation. Dampen, um, the main, re the main uh, 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 definition of dampen is to make something wet. Okay, um, so it's, it's, it's necessary to damp oscillation. Okay, but damper controls the rate at which the energy is dissipated because obviously, You'll, you'll remember back when I was, um, back when you were doing vibrational dynamics, if you've got a spring with no damper, then the spring will, you know, in the absence of any other forces, will oscillate um, continuously. Um, if you stick a damper in there, obviously that, that oscillation, uh, energy from oscillation, is going to be um, uh, um, diminished as the damper will take energy out of the system or dissipates the energy uh, as heat. Okay, that kinetic energy converted to heat. Um, in vehicles, it's almost always viscous damping. Okay, um, non-viscous damping is often undesirable. Okay, where the damping force is dependent upon the velocity. So, if you've got a vehicle in a steady-state corner where you've got a constant roll angle, there's no actual suspension movement. The damping will actually have no impact whatsoever. So, things like the roll angle, there's no no impact of damping. But obviously, on corner entry and corner exit, where the Suspension is responding to to the vehicle handling. Obviously, the damping force will impact those because the thing's moving, and the faster it moves, the more damping you're going to get. Okay, so like I said, it depends. It's it's um, predominantly based upon uh, uh, kinematic velocity as opposed to the actual uh, position. 
Um, and generally, like I said, the hydraulic, uh, you have a telescopic shock absorber, okay, damper the oscillation. And so what you have with the damper is you have a, 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 a essentially a, a, a hydraulic actuator in a sense. So with a piston, but through the piston are some orifices. And obviously, um, you know, you, what you're doing is you're forcing fluid through, the, through those orifices, which will take energy out of the system. Um, and you end up with a with a with a damper. Um, often you'll have check valves on those orifices so that the flow in and the flow out through the piston will be different sizes to give you different bump and rebound rates. Okay, so that's bump is compression and rebound is extension. Okay. So um so there's a so well there's a picture of a damper, it's a very simple single tube um, damper. Actually, modern cars now have slightly different uh, arrangements. But what you've got here is that, so there's your you connect the top to one side of the chassis, the bottom to the suspension system, okay, and then you've got like I said this volume of uh, of hydraulic fluid, okay, some sort of mineral oil or something, um, and you have these uh, these are called check valves, okay, and obviously as the piston moves, let's say that you're going through compression, so the piston is moving down, the flow will actually flow out of this orifice on the, the right hand side. Through that check valve into the into the top of the chamber, and uh, and uh, and obviously the um, yeah, and the top of the chamber will come slightly bigger volume. Okay, and obviously in the extension, this um, this moves up. The flow will not flow out of this one, but it will flow through the left hand side because that's the way the check valve works through this orifice. And obviously by changing those orifice sizes, you can change the different rates. This volume at the bottom, ten, is basically the um the uh, a bit of um be a gaseous medium in here with a, with a membrane nine um, because obviously the volume um, at the top needs to compensate for the volume of the rod okay obviously if this is all the way up okay if, imagine it's completely extended then there's the volume below the piston will be greater than when this is completely compressed because obviously the volume of the rod needs to be taken into account so this gaseous medium at the bottom will also will allow you to compensate for that difference in volume okay so in terms of uh, damping rates this is the typical sort of damper diagram okay so you've got uh, along here the damping force fd okay um and you've got your um uh, velocity um speed the shock absorber speed uh, z dot okay and obviously in the rebound okay um where it's extending You've got a positive value for z dot okay and obviously um, and you can have like i said rising rate damping as well uh, where the, the speed um, you know where it's not a, a straight line so there's a rebound movement there and then obviously the compression movement you can see um it's uh, reduced so there's different rates and like i said these are also not linear and that's generally the way um, um, a damper will work, okay? Passive dampers. Um, yeah, so that's the schematic, okay? So they're called single tube shock absorbers, similar design with enclosed gas volume separated from worker chambers. The varnishes is quite a clean design, makes sense, okay? Low weight and can be freely oriented. One of the disadvantages of such a damper is the length of the damper, okay? Um, and you get uh, there's some increased friction. Um, and the high requirements with regard to sealing the piston rod and the gas volume okay um that's a very simple damper um often most modern cars have a twin tube shock absorber okay which is a slightly different sch schematic but similar principles they've got a compensating chamber resulting from the arrangement of an outer tube around the working cylinder that acts as a reservoir with a face damper oil okay um you've got lower shock absorber length uh, you've got softer responsiveness, lower requirements with regard to seals, lower costs, but, in, uh, but you know, due to economies of scale. Okay, uh, disadvantages is they haven't got great, quite so much heat dissipation and restricted insulation. Okay, you'll know that um, with some very high uh, end performance um, dampers, you'll often have a, a remote reservoir, um, and that's obviously a different, a further type of um, shock absorber. That, um, that, uh, that allows you to have the reservoir outside of the actual uh, shock absorber um, itself. Um, so those are passive dampers, the, the, but there are you know, more and more, becoming more and more common, uh, the idea of active dampers or adaptive dampers, okay? 
these can either be automatically controlled or 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 passively adjustable okay and there's a one way to adjust the conflict between driving comfort and handling okay so you've got these two competing goals ride comfort and vehicle handling and obviously um you know often those are not uh, they're mutually exclusive you can't have one without the other so sort of the, the the impact of one will affect the impact of the other often detrimentally okay um so one way to do that is to use an adjustable damper um and if it's semi-active um then you can actually change the behavior of the damper um during a a, a drive okay Alter to better suit the road or the driving style. Okay. Often these rely on solenoids and valves that can control the apertures through which the oil flows inside the damper. Okay. A small aperture restricts flow, which funds up the damper. And obviously, if you can increase the size of the aperture, you get a softer damping. Okay. And obviously, there are some advantages. You can discrete, you know, um, uh, you can change the damping through a wide range of, of different. Um, uh, uh, you know, ends from being very soft or very hard can be switched manually or activated automatically depending on the driving state and it, like i said it's becoming increasingly common so you you buy a performance car now often there'll be some adaptive damping you can change the the setting of the vehicle chassis through you know comfort mode through to sport and sport plus and stuff and one of the things that that's doing is it's altering the damping rate okay so while the you know as i mentioned in steady state you'll actually end up with the same roll angle even if you've got the, the car set on sport plus the speed at which it gets there will be um reduced because of the the um the, the damping force is going to be greater okay um so that's like i said it's becoming more and more common to have adaptive damping or active damping which looks at how the vehicle is performing and depending upon the setting that you've got in your car you can um uh, increase or reduce that uh, or decrease that um, and the, but the disadvantage, obviously, there is a general cost associated with it. On lower end performance cars, there's often often a relatively expensive option to have active damping. Okay, and obviously you need some sort of control system that's going to work with the with the with the with the, with the vehicle to set it up. Okay, so that's what, using a solenoid. The other way to have um, active damping is to use uh, what's known as a rheological fluid inside the. So there's magneto rheological or electrological um, uh, oil okay and basically the way they adjust is they don't change the orifices through the cylinder but you what you can do with the with rheological fluids you can actually alter the viscosity of the fluid within that um within that shock absorber okay by applying a magnetic field around the, the fluid because essentially what you have inside the fluid is you've got some little uh, uh particles of a ferrous uh, material like iron or something and if you apply a magnetic field to that um, that oil, um, all those um, uh, particles will align themselves and essentially make the oil stiffer. Okay, increasing the viscosity. Okay, so the electromagnetic, rheological, electro-rheological fluids that change their viscosity under the influence of magnetic or electrical field are used instead of uh, mineral oil. Viscosity has a direct influence on the resistance through the orifice or through those valves. Advantages: very short adjustment time. You can, you know, if you switch on the magnetic field, suddenly the the mineral oil becomes very viscous, so you get a very a very quick response. Okay, uh, and obviously it's very variable depending on the strength of the magnetic field you apply. There's no moving parts or solenoids or anything like that, so it's very reliable and it's quite power efficient. Clearly, there is a cost associated with such a system, and the control and the control system is necessary. There are a bunch of cars that have got this sort of set up. Um, uh, I think the R8, Audi R8, had magnetorheological uh, dampers in them. There's a bunch of American cars, Cadillacs, and those sorts of things, um, uh, had uh, have um, magnetorheological dampers as well. And those sorts of things. So yeah, but like I said, you can look them up on Wikipedia or whatever. I'll show you a bunch of cars that have got had them in the past. So here we go. Yeah, there's a list on Wikipedia. Acura MDX, Audi TC, and R8, Buick Lucerne, Cadillacs, a whole bunch of Cadillacs, the Corvette, the Camaro ZL1, 
Four player Italia Flori, five hundred GTB, F twelve, Mustang Mackey, Shelby GT three fifty, Holden HS three, Lamborghini Huracan. Um, there's a whole bunch of um uh, um yeah cars. Um often uh, produced by uh, a first first tier supplier called Delphi, okay. Um and uh, and they've got a party name called Magnolide. Yep, so there's a whole bunch of um applications of um, uh, laser sedumpers. Yeah, so that's essentially what's going on. Um, oh, yeah, the magnum ride actuator. So like I said, you've got the piston rod, um, and then you've got the fluid, the MR fluid, magnum neurological fluid, going through orifices. And like I said, what they're doing is they're actually applying a magnetic field to the fluid that's within the orifice, okay, to stiffen it up as it's passing through. Okay, and so you've got a low pressure and high pressure slow as well. Okay, and the area in which it's affected is within that, that field. Okay. So there's a whole cross section. And so when you've got a when you've got a damper, adjustable damper, then you end up with a range of movement. Okay, so um, so here we've got our damper um, uh, you know, um, graph again, um, and again you've got rebound and compression there. And the dash line would be the the the, non, the standard passive damper, and lines one and two are going to be the ranges of which those dampers can operate. So one one would be your sport session setting with the high damping uh, forces, uh, and two would be your comfort setting. So the thing can vary between those two um, ranges of, of motion. Okay. So um. Lastly, for this uh, chapter, talk about active suspension. I've got some videos to show you with this bit. Okay, basically, as I mentioned, though, in all vehicles, you've got this compromise between ride hand, uh, handling and ride. Uh, uh, yeah, handling and ride. And I mentioned at the beginning of the chapter that the primary focus of a racing car will be around handling, the grip, and the primary focus of a conventional road car would be ride. And obviously, you've got to try and meet someone in the middle. And, like I said, sporty road cars will have a slight bias towards handling, but they'll still need to accommodate the ride because it's a road car. Whereas obviously, um, you know, luxury cars and things will often focus on having excellent ride, and we'd be less um, uh, fixated on providing great handling. Um, and uh, but active suspension helps to try and deal with this compromise. Okay, um, uh, basically, ride is all about the vertical forces. And handling is all about the lateral forces, is one way to think of it. Okay. And obviously, racing cars, you want good lateral and uh, for and longitudinal, um, yeah, being able to deal with those forces. And obviously, ride is about the up and down motion, the impact of the road on the vehicle. Um, right. Okay. And access suspension basically tries to solve this, this, uh, this compromise. Okay. Because instead of what you're doing with, with passive. Springs and dampers, where once you've installed the spring and the damper at those set rates, you have no control over what application they're being used in. Active, ideally, is you're replacing those springs and dampers with an active element, yeah. and uh, you can actually can imp in, you, know, you can impact how the vehicle responds. Um, so yeah, the idea is to, for them to be fast acting, so high bandwidth, um, closed loop control, which can change the characteristics to suit the influences. On the outside, okay, and like I said, particularly attractive in motorbike applications where ground effect requires a flat, stable platform to work effectively. And like I said, Williams F1 in the 92 and 93 actually ran a car with active suspension where they replaced the uh, suspension units with actual hydraulic um, actuators, and so they could actually control the vehicle um, chassis. And like I said, they were very successful back in, in those days. Um, in fact, there might be a um, uh, let's try. Let's see if there's a uh... yeah. So there's a, there's a bunch of videos on YouTube. Let's see if this one works. McDonald's Big Mac. Right. Adverts on YouTube. So if I if, let me um, see if I can uh, play this video on uh, on um, 
Let's um uh let's see if this works. So if I stop showing this, show the application screen window. You may not get sound through, I'm not sure. Let's see. To go, Formula One had some of the most incredible technology the sport has ever seen. The cars had automatic self-adjusting suspension. So you see there you've got the uh, these um push rods, okay going through the bell crank, and instead of there being a spring and damper, there are these actuators, okay? Um, Electronically controlled actuators that, that did the suspension move movement. up and down to increase grip and yeah. performance. It was extremely effective until the technology was deemed too dangerous and was banned from the sport. But how can suspension trickery improve a car's performance? How did a complex system like this even work with such old technology? Can you, can you hear the commentary or not? Okay. So yeah, so um, something like that. I don't know what the frame rate is like over Calibrate either. But um, that's why I've got them. Why doesn't modern F1 use suspension like this? All of that coming up. Yeah, there's a 10 minute video here Look about- at this onboard footage of the Williams FW14B at Spa. Notice how the car is unbelievably stable with next to no body roll in the corners. Compare this to Ayrton Senna's McLaren that year and notice the instability and roll of the car due to the conventional spring and damper suspension system. And the dominance, the superiority of the Williams here in Kyle Army is quite incredible because even though Senna is in, as James has said, last year's car, so for that matter are Nigel Nassau and Ricardo Patrese with the notable exception of the fact that they have the new active suspension, which has no conventional metal springs. Instead, it has high pressure hydraulics. Yeah. So like I said, in motorsport, it was quite successful until it was banned in Formula 1. Okay, um, it's now not so, and it needs to be passive. Um, but obviously in cars, in road cars, you don't have to um, ban it. Um, it's, in, it's in development and, and uh, in use. Um, so if I go back to my presentation um yeah so uh yeah so um so yeah like i said f1 and go and look, look that up the driver 61 video which is the one we're just watching is quite good um and basically well yeah so instead of the spring damper system simply responding to the road and driver inputs you've got an actuation system as part of that okay um it can either be in conjunction with or in, instead of okay um, can introduce a force into that suspension system. Okay, like I said, passive systems are generally set up for a particular set of parameters or scenarios. Okay, and that um, that scenario and that those parameters are often based around you know a, there'll be a compromise between handling and ride, and depending on the application of the vehicle and uh, the scenarios in which it uh, it will be used, obviously there'll be a, a a compromise struck that's suitable. Okay. Um, whereas a fully active system can essentially, you know, by having some sensors and uh, detecting what driving, the, what situation is, you know, what the situation is, um, you can obviously make some judgments about that sort of driving and, um, uh, and what's occurring and then respond to that. Okay. But that, so fully active replaces all the passive components between the spring and unsprung mass and aims to control the suspension over the full bandwidth of the system that was the um that was the williams uh uh setup um it was used um they, i think it was tried earlier in the 70s i think colin chapman tried to have a lotus running action suspension if you do some search um lotus action suspension will come up um but one of the issues around that was the fact that um that uh that you ended up with a um a system that was very um uh, it was very it consumed, it consumed a lot of power. Obviously, Williams managed to crack that nut um, so much that they could actually implement it. But like I said, Colin Chapman, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of documentation around action suspension um, uh, around the Lotus as well. Um, yeah, consumes a similar amount of power, requires actuators of very high bandwidth, so high speed, high force, um, and obviously you need control algorithms to control it. And they are quite tricky, um, you know, relatively complex with all the sensors and stuff to make sense of what you want it to do 
and those are obviously the costs associated with that much more expensive than, than their passive systems. Okay. One sort of uh, slimmed down version of active suspension is where you just the only thing you're controlling is actually roll. So instead of you having a passive anti roll bar, uh, what you can do is make that roll element um, uh, some you know, active, like I said, and that's one of the things you could do with hydraulic anti roll, okay. Um, or, like I said, or if you've got some sort of mechanical um, system that can change the uh, stiffness of the roll bar, well, then obviously that will give you some active roll control. Okay, and basically what you do is in the corners you apply an opposite roll moment to the, to the vehicle body to counteract that, 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 uh, that roll moment due to the lateral acceleration. Okay, one of the advantages of this is you can retain the passive system for the vertical motion, the suspension system. Um, and obviously, in uh, with off-roaders and stuff, you can what you can do is you can basically disconnect the roll bar, so you've got very high axle articulation um, and those sorts of things. Uh, but then, on the road where you actually want a bit of roll stiffness, you can then uh, turn it on and it will become roll stiffness. Relatively expensive. There's lots of cars, um, certainly big, bulky SUV stroke crossover type vehicles, have some form of roll control. Okay. Um, and the power consumption is relatively low. Um, there's lots of cars that have got it, and like I said, I mean, even like the uh, the old um, Land Rover Discovery 2 had um, uh, uh, active roll control, but it's, it's like I said, it's been around for a long time, uh, in, in the, in many luxury cars and that sort of stuff have it as well. Um, there's a, I think I've got a picture here. This is a, this is a Citroen Zantia. That This is the, one of those vehicles that's got that hydro pneumatic. And they actually had a, a, a car called the Zantia Activa that contained this um, sort of anti-roll. And so you, clearly the blue car here is a is a passive system. You can see in a, in a sort of elk test type thing, a slalom, you can see how much it rolls with the Activa. You can see what, you know, there's a very little in terms of the similar amount of roll. So it had a very, you know, like I said, an anti-roll um, uh, active suspension system in that, making use of the... Uh, the hydropneumatic suspension as well. Um, yeah, so in terms of recent developments in, in road cars, certainly, what what is happening sort of recent, more recently in some of the um, more prominent applications is the you can you retain a, a spring and a damper. The damper could be um, active um, as well, um, but you place an actuator in series with that with that with that damper and spring. Okay. And uh, and in terms of some of the developments, you get a system where it's becoming more sophisticated, with cameras that can read the road ahead and adjust characteristics accordingly. So you can see a bump coming up and will adjust the the, um, the the characteristics based upon those bumps, or whatever. And it can also control roll while still retaining high levels of comfort. Okay, and there's even a setup on the Mercedes um, S Class, uh, certainly the S Class Coupe, where you have what's known as a, a curve tilting function, so the, the car actually leans slightly into a corner like a motorcycle. So instead of it rolling out of the corner, they've actually got active elements um, pushing it the other way. And I've got so I've got more videos. So there's a picture of it. You can see the car is actually going around a corner, which goes to the right. If we as we're looking at it, and you can see that the the roll of the vehicle body is actually in the opposite direction. But I've got more. It's better in some of the videos I've got up. So. Yeah, so active suspension. This is um, this was from a long time ago. Bose, the uh, the, the the company that make uh, sound systems. Obviously, they have a um, they've uh, have some experience um in active suspension. So if I if I just uh, change the, what you can see, so if I stop showing this, go to this one. Okay, another video. This is the Bose setup. For 24 years, Bose worked on what it hoped would be a revolutionary electromagnetic suspension system that would offer an incredibly smooth ride for cars. The secret project was called Project Sound. You should be able to build a car that basically flies along the ground, stays level all the time. So when you get to a bumpy road, it should stay level, and when you turn and brake, it should stay level. When we started the project, we actually started with a luxury sedan. So we bought two. So you've got a couple of Lexuses here, old Lexuses. And uh, the white car has got the suspension, as both the active suspension and the, well, the grey one hasn't. I just wonder if I can make this, uh, here we go, make this bigger, there we go. 
put one to the side and we modified the other. This is the unmodified vehicle. That's what we're starting with. And it's going to come down at a good rate of speed. And then it's going to make a hard turn, lane change. And then we're going to do a very hard braking maneuver. Then it'll come over these bumps and then it'll slalom back. So now the white car, same make, same model, same everything, except completely modified suspension system. We'll bring the cars down one after the other at a fairly slow clip. I just want you to watch the body motion. <laughs> to finish the demo, Bose gives us a look at a springy feature it had no intention of putting into a passenger vehicle, but is a fun way to show off how high-tech and powerful the suspension system is. <laughs> oh, is there a visual sensor that, that can sense yeah, so the Jumping over the... Uh, you know, it's funny. Right after we did it the very the first time, I remember person asking Dr. Bose that same question and his answer was he said when I was six years old I started studying magic the first two things they tell you about magic is never repeat the trick and never tell them how you did it <laughs> in the end the project was a technical success but a commercial failure the suspension system was deemed too heavy and too expensive to integrate into mainstream vehicles mm -hmm. Bose was able to use what it learned from the project to create a special car seat for truckers called Bose Ride Bose says it sold lots of seats, but it's still a niche product for them. There you go. So that's our, that's our active suspension from the past, okay? Um, and then this is some more recent stuff. So, like I said, Mercedes-Benz have got a system called, they call Magic Body Control, featured in the old um, S-Class. Um, so um, this is a video Traveling about that. and working at the same time. In the new S-Class, passengers have the option videos. of enjoying a completely new level of comfort. Mercedes-Benz now offers Magic Body Control, a world premiere thanks to the first ever predictive suspension system. The unique aspect of our predictive suspension system is that we now use stereo cameras to scan the road surface in real time up to 15 meters ahead of the vehicle. This function is known as the road surface scan and truly is a world premiere. We are the first to do this and to do it in real time on board. It's never been done before. Cars like the Rolls Royce have this now as well, the Rolls Royce Phantom. Uh, they, they can read the road and adjust the suspension accordingly as well. The stereo cameras measure the height of obstacles with a precision of 3 millimeters or better, and at speeds of up to 130 kilometers per hour. In the second step, the measurement data defining the exact road profile is passed on to the suspension system. And thus, the active suspension system knows ahead of time which bumps it's about to drive over and can adapt so that the body glides far more smoothly over the road than a conventional vehicle. As such, the suspension system can actively compensate for uneven surfaces. This prevents the body from oscillating and vibrating. Mercedes-Benz expands the familiar active body control with the road surface scan and thus achieves a new dimension of passenger comfort. Body Magic body control enables us to provide a completely so new like level example, of comfort and drop is the best, passed on to the suspension system. And thus the active suspension system knows ahead of time which bumps it's about to drive over and can adapt so that the body glides far more smoothly over the road than a conventional vehicle. As such, the suspension system can actively... So that's, that's the Mercedes um, magic body control, but they also have a system called curve tilt function, as I mentioned. So this is the, this is the, uh, uh, the um, not the latest S-Class Coupe, but um, um, one of them. And it talks of, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's another corporate video, but there's no, um, there's no commentary to this one. So you can see, um, back a bit. You see the car. You can see that what this car on the um, on the left there is uh, tilting to the inside, whereas this this one is not. Okay. That's demonstrating the active element in the in series with the spring and damper. Um, so that's another picture. 
So again, you can see the car on the uh, on the left here. It's got this. Uh, you look at the, the ground clearance between the two sides. You can see it's tilting towards the inside of the corner. The reason why I know it's in series is if I go back over to this point, um, they've got basically pictures of it driving along a road, and you've got the uh, the left and the right, and you and watch what happens as it goes around a tight corner coming up. You'll see that the um, you've got an actuator in here. Look on the left hand side, you can see the actuator rod. And then when it comes into this corner, you can see the it's adjusting the suspension in the corners. Tight corner coming up. You see the left plunger pushed all the way out, and the right plunger is coming back. Okay. So, yeah, so that's basically some videos of action suspension. There's loads of stuff online about this, this, this sort of stuff, you know, videos on YouTube and that sort of thing. Which is obviously fun to see. Um, so you can take a take a look yourself. Uh, so if I go back to the uh, presentation, I think we're pretty much there. Yes, that's slide sixty out of sixty. Okay, so that's that's basically chapter three. Okay, um, covers in covering springs and dampers. The questions that are in chapter three, if I. Um, go to the uh, the notes. So go back. Uh, so if I go here, and I go to showing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is obviously these are the notes um, you've got. There's a bunch of questions at the end, um, some of which are uh, are description sort of thing, explaining the functions of a suspension spring, how the range of materials and designs commonly used in fashion vehicles. And then there's a, a couple of sort of mathematical ones about. There's a very similar to the um, question two is very similar to que in class question three point one. Question four is very similar to in class question three point two, and those are the answers. Okay. And then, uh, and then uh, obviously there's another question. Question five, I think, uh, is about length, spring length. Um, yeah, that sort of stuff. So you can, like I said, have a have a, a go at those questions, and the solutions are on Blackboard. I did notice a couple of typos, so I should fix those. I'm just saying that's that's, that's uh, um, yeah, let's have a go at those. Are there any questions? A bit of a long session, really. I'm focusing on descriptive stuff, but that's okay. Hello, Ben. Can you hear me? I can hear you, James, yeah. I've got a question about the coil spring with um, like the McPherson strut set up. Sorry, the... Um, yeah, okay. I'm wondering, I've never found out why, but have you ever replaced a coil spring on one of them? Or seen a viable replacement? Yeah. Uh, yes, I mean, basically, no, well, well, I'm why, why, why are you asking? What I'm wondering is, because when you replace them, the spring's yeah. already under compression within the dampener. Yeah, that's right. Is there, is there a reason why they do that? Well, it holds the whole thing together, but basically you have to, um, you have to, um, yeah, I mean, you, the, the damper, and well, yeah, I mean, I don't, why is it under compression, I guess? Set up of a you can buy like coil with kits for your car as well. Yeah, the right height, but also you're compressing the spring more. I was thinking, yeah. of course, opposing a bump would be greater, so wouldn't that make effect if you were to Yeah, I mean, obviously, the, the spring will be set up to give you a, a, a specific ride height, 
obviously the you know statically the vehicle will be compressed in the spring because there's a you know there's a the load of the mass of the vehicle is on the spring as well um but and obviously depending on how much you you know work because obviously a spring increases the force the more you deflect it doesn't it yeah. um yeah you know, so um but uh, but there'll be a, a certain preload on the spring um such that when the vehicle is statically you've got it's like got adequate move, movement from you know when it's in motion uh, but obviously when it's static it will be compressed as well so um, i'm not quite sure what the question is but yeah i mean you know look on chris fix or you know uh, you know loads of loads of uh you know car throttle they've got um loads of videos of people doing like spring changing the you know dampers and springs and sort of stuff um often you've got to you've got to have a spring compressor so there's like a tool that comes around the spring it compresses it so you can get the thing out. Um, uh, yeah, I've done it um, myself, like doing spring oh, okay. yeah. But I was just wondering why, when you put the top top mount on, why is under compression? Yeah. The only reason I think is why is under compression is to stop it, stop it from rattling when you're driving. Yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, obviously, when the when the damper and the spring is, is not in the car, it's going to be as extended as it can be. Um, but but I suspect they it, the spring is under some compression just to keep the whole thing together. Uh, otherwise, yeah. you will end up yeah with it loose. But obviously, once the spring's in the car and the spring is compressed, it's applying an opposing load to the top and the bottom of, of where the spring is located, uh, which keeps it obviously yeah, it keeps you from laughing around. Um, yeah, and gives you yeah, obviously yeah makes sense. Um, yeah, to, to do that. But, um, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Basically, that's what I mean. Yeah, that's, yeah. Because I think yeah, the spring will be. Compressed within the, within the housing, even if the, when the when the spring and damp is not in the car, from the way I think it was designed. Yeah, because yeah. usually when you get a snap spring, you can tell because it rattles because yes. the the yeah. force is gone. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah, cool. Thank you. We'll be covering my first instruct next week. So. Okay. Yeah. Another question there. What car were you replacing on? Me? Yeah. Doors. Whatever comes Sorry? in the garage. Whatever comes through the door. Oh, you work in a garage? I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I've been doing it for about six years, so. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. Like I say, the worst is probably an X5. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you can, uh, that's the little wishbone, isn't it? The X5? Not in the front. Oh, no, it's just a job. Okay, fine. Double whispering stuff on the front. Uh, sorry, it's a, it's a, it is a double whispering, isn't it? Yeah, on the front of the spring through the middle. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. So it's a double whispering. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool, okay. Um, right, any other questions from Kieran, Dan, or Will? Or, or even James? Okay. Nothing from Will. So, like I said, I'll stick those uh, MATLAB um, uh, simulation files up on Blackboard for you to have a look at. They might already already be up there. I'm not sure. Well, I'm going to take a look because there is some um, stuff up there already. Uh, not those ones. I'll just stick them up there. And you can have a look at those. Yeah. Okay. I'll do that. Um, yeah, okay, well, thank you very much. Um, that's the end of this uh, session. Um, I shall uh, see you uh, um, next week, hopefully on campus, um, if I feel better. I should do, hopefully I will. Um, yeah, so that's, um, that's the end. I shall uh, stop the recording. Thank you very much.